Okay, so uh, so far we have dealt with um, the step problem in physics. Why is it that things appear to be quantum? That quantum bits because they are simply that's the answer. In, in, in digital physics, they are bits of information, and we dealt with then the space-time problem. How can it be that you know that is Zeno's paradoxes and the Thomson's lamp paradox and all those similar types of paradoxes? How can you know those things be, and why is there that weird that weirdness to them? And it's because time and space cease to exist when you get down to a certain level. I mean, when you get down to like the Planck time, time and space just cease to be, and they're not there. And all that's there is mathematical calculations that tell you to move from stage one of existence to stage two of existence. And so. Um, We've dealt with that then, so reality is more like a picture book, like a movie, like a film, where individual frames are occurring and there's nothing happening in between. There's literally nothing happens, so you literally just go from up to down or down to up. And like a cork literally goes from existence of up to down. There's no in-between stages. A particle literally goes from this space and then space to this existence in space, and there's no in-between. It doesn't exist in the in-between. Uh, so in the digital universe, it's being run by calculations that are existing outside of time and space, since time and space are being calculated by the same functions. So just like a particle has a uh, probability function, and, and it tells the electron to exist somewhere along that probability, it only begins to exist somewhere along that probability once you do some sort of, once it has a reason to exist. So if the particle is being emitted, so-called, inside here with the electric emitter, and then it exists somewhere in this probability, Sometimes it'll exist outside the box without ever existing inside the box. Even though it, it was generated inside the box, the probability wave was generated, but it didn't begin, the particle itself, the electron, didn't begin to exist until it existed here or here. And uh, when it exists here, it exists outside the box, it never harms the box. That is the Joseph Sun's um, junction, which we which went through in a in previous video series. And so it just begins to exist outside, and this is used as a electricity regulator. So. Um, What's important about that to understand, then, is that it doesn't exist anywhere in space until the calculations tell it to. All those calculations that make time and space and stuff exist are, are underneath, underneath reality, so to speak. They're not in our time-space universe. So, and if we look far enough down, we begin to see that. So what would, we, what would we expect to see if we lived in a digital world? This is what we expect to see, exactly what we see in the quantum world. This quantum weirdness is what we'd expect to see. It is what we would predict to see if we were living in a virtual reality. We'd expect to see jumps and not continuums. Discontinu discon discontinuity and not continuums. Right, so what about, um, I just want to, it's already been kind of answered, but just in case, I want to explain in a little bit more detail the A and B experiment. So you have um, the, the, the quantum entanglement problem in physics. That is, how can it be that these things appear to be communicating faster than the speed of light? They're not. Remember, they don't exist in any state until the function tells them to. The function is existing outside of time and space. And all the functions of reality are making time and space exist for us, and, and, or just in general. And so the functions are taking place outside of time and space. And so once you know this calculation, the function says that that, that, Z, that the other quantum particle, or the entangled particle, must exist in the opposite Z. So that's how that happens. This particle is measured. Its, it's twin particle is measured. Either, either one is measured first. The other one must exist in the opposite state. They, 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 neither one existed in either state or they existed in both states until measured. So there's that quantum calculation happening. There, there's, a, there's an actual function, an actual calculation happening, like a mathematical calculation happening outside of the reality we live in, outside of time and space. And it's saying that these entangled particles exist in one of these states or all these states right now as probable. They, they exist in probable states. It's only when we make a measurement that that calculation, that function, would, would exist outside of time and space, so it's not violating the speed of light in our reality, since it's functioning outside of time and space. It then says, hey, there was a measurement made on this one, and so now it definitely exists, and so this one must definitely exist too. So that's how that works. It's the mathematical function working outside of time and space, or in, underneath the Planck time, where we can't exist inside of, where, where whole steps are made, um, and where, not, or where no steps are made, you know, or where infinite steps are made, if you want to look at it that way. Another way to look at that, that gap I was speaking about with time, where the infinite steps should take place, you can just say, hey, infinite steps take place. I mean, it doesn't really matter how you look at it. Really, there's no steps being taken place, though, if it's digital. In a computer world, the computer doesn't calculate for all that. And we'll get into how and why it should be that way. 
one of the other weirdnesses we got into is what about this what about the wave itself what about the probability wave why should there be a probability wave that the electron might exist upon and this is where we get into uh, whys of the, of the electric world so it really has to do with efficiency what's what's more efficient it seems the reality works efficiently it just seems that's to be a function of reality as it works it works efficiently and in fact efficiency might be an inherent function of reality but what is reality well reality is in part the virtual world we exist in right or a type of virtual world this digital world we exist in let's say but we're gonna call it virtual world um, and since that is part of reality another part of reality is the functions and one of the functions is one of the functions is indeed the um, telling of the wave function itself, the probable, the probability wave, saying where the electron might be right now. You know, these are the places it probably could be, but it's in none of those places yet. And we know it's in none of those places because of of uh, Joseph's lamp. So you can't say it's in all places, because if it were in all places, let's look at Joseph's lamp for example again, really quick. I never explained this. I should have. Okay, so not Joseph's lamp. <laughs> Joseph's junction. Joseph's son's junction. Okay. So um, if the particle exists in every place along this line, then it also exists here interacting with the wall. And if that's true, then it's interacting with the wall and we would see wear and tear on the wall caused by the electrons because it's a very fragile wall. What we, you know, it was made of very fragile material which an electron would actually have an effect on. But guess what happens? It never affects the wall. So the electron never exists there. It never actually interacts with the wall. But hey, that looks like it's a place, one of the places it should exist is there, interact the wall, but it never exists there. Even though it seems to be one of the places it should be able to exist, it exists here or here outside, mostly here. Um, so the point being that the electron truly is a non-existent entity. And that, that's so important to understand. That device shows, and, and quantum mechanics itself shows, all the math shows, electrons, neutrons, protons, all these fundamental particles for reality are not real things until they need to exist do they exist now why would it be that way and this would be again about efficiency so so perhaps there's an efficiency function within the underlying functions of reality there's a whole bunch of functions we'll call them codes or calculations properties whatever you want to call them there's a bunch of underlying calculations taking place that makes our world work the way it does and so for efficiency's sake what would be the point of billions upon trillions and trillions, oh my god, the number Googleplexes of particles existing throughout space. Imagine, like, in just one little region of space, like on Earth, how many electrons and neutrons and protons there must be that, that are not active right now, They're not that are not even existing in objects like cups and stuff. There's so many of them. Googleplexes in the entire universe. That would be a waste of efficiency, a waste of calculation, a waste of space. You know, there's no reason for them to exist, so why exist? And, and, and we can see that seems to be the way reality works. If there's really no reason for something totally to be there, it just doesn't seem to be there. Um, re reality seems to try to work as efficiently as possible. And of course, obviously, it can't always work as, as efficiently as possible, but it seems to try to do that. And every, li every, every living species seems to try to do that even. So then, so the reason behind this could be, especially if we are coded by some other entity or something, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into why that can't be and why that's not the way it is. But um, and with, with, with my philosophy, I'm just trying to still nail down digital philosophy before I get into economic philosophy because it, it's a good primer for what I believe in. So if, uh, if it's more efficient for particles to exist as probabilities, as, uh, you know, in other words, it's easier to program. It's, it takes up less space and less efficiency to just say, hey, the electron exists somewhere here along this probable wave. But it doesn't actually exist. It not, it's not actually being rendered yet. There's no power being used yet. It's just like very little power to say it exists somewhere in there, just a probability wave. And it's easier for it to exist as this probability wave. Now, another reason why I think this true randomness must exist, that is, once it does exist, it just pops anywhere randomly with, with some probability, 80% chance of being here, you know, less chance of being here, less here. And as you go down further away from that line, and then finally no existence here. In, in the negative space. There's no existence there. And then it begins to exist again. These negative spaces where it doesn't exist at all are the gaps. And that because of that wave function, because of that wave form of the um, thing, because there's these gaps where the electron cannot exist and only can exist probably in these stages, the most probable state is here. As you get down here, it gets less and less probable. Then it gets completely impossible. And this is what causes the gaps, these wave 
wave reality uh, of things, probable waves, give the gaps which, which are here, these black gaps. These are where time and space don't exist. It's not even probable for the electron to exist there. But if you have an overlapping wave, what's weird is the electron can exist here in a high probability. So it's not that that, that region of space is off, it's, it's a calculation which shows that it's not like a real grid or something. There's nothing real there. It's literally just calculations. So in these calculations, there are places where electrons can exist and so forth. Well, that would be more efficient than it would be to actually render every single entire electron as a visible object that could exist in some real way. That has Because then, if it exists as a real particle, it has to then begin to inter, intermingle with other things and bounce off of them and all this kind of stuff. And that's like, wow, that's a lot of calculation. It would basically be like this. Like, think about it as a video game. A video game is a great analogy. You're in a video game, right? And let's say you're on this map. And way over here in the corner of a map, there's this clock in a room. And this room is walled off with a door. And you're way over here. You can see the walls, but you can't see the clock. Well, why should I, as the programmer, make that walk click, make that clock click, unless there's someone in there to see it? There's no point, right? So I leave this, the clock right now is existing as a probable thing in code. So the code says, hey, it exists as a probable thing. This is where the clock ought to be, you know, as far as sec seconds go and all that. And, and so it's kind of running the calculations for where the clock should be and, click and ticking, but it's not being rendered in here because rendering it would take too much space and too much time, too many polygons and, and stuff like that. And I want to I use as much resources as I can to make the game as fast as possible, and why waste them on a clock that no one can see? Once the character enters in this room, that triggers a function in the, in the programming which says, now you can see the clock, the clock renders, and now they can see the clock moving. But prior to that, the clock's not moving, the clock's not even there. It just exists as a, as, a, as a probable thing of where it should be. So if they, if they calculate, okay, I was here right now at 3 o'clock, and they leave, and they come back, it's going to be, the clock's going to change. It's not going to be stuck at 3 o'clock again. It's not like it freezes. The, the math still tells it to move, but it's not physically moving in the universe, and so it takes up less resources. Okay, so efficiency seems to be the, the problem. Efficiency seems to be the reason why uh, things exist probably and not actually. And so electrons don't exist actually and, and begin to act as particles until they need to. But even then, they're only existing as virtual objects, and they move in steps. Even when they exist, even when they act as particles, they still move in steps. All the quantum world moves in steps. Well, if all the quantum world moves in steps, and we're all made of quantum stuff, of things that move in steps and not, continue, not, and not in some continuity and some infinities, then how can we appear to be moving infinities? That must be an illusion, which I've explained earlier why the illusion would be strong. But not only that, things aren't solid because the electron isn't solid. The electron is made up of, of just waves and things that go through each other. And, and like in, in its trueness form, the electron, even when it acts as a particle, is not a physical object. You never actually touch it. It has forces, and those forces repel off each other. But the, the forces themselves aren't even real. So for example, if you're in a video game, right? And I program this ball to have properties. And the properties of this ball is that it bounces off you. It has a collision. And that collision bounces off you. You're this person here. Right? And so when the ball hits you, it bounces off you because I told it to. I gave it properties that says when you interact with this thing, you bounce off of it. Now, if you were a video game character and you're trying to calculate why does that happen, you would say, oh, hey, this ball has a force to it. And this force when it interacts with this force, repels each other. And you would describe that in a mathematical way that made sense, and it would make sense, because everything works in a very mathematical way, because the underlining, you're, you're not understanding it correctly, but you're understanding it enough that it makes sense. But there'd be some weirdness with your mathematical equations, some things you can't predict totally accurately, and that's what we see in the real world. Our maths aren't totally correct, because we're not looking at the world yet as a digital thing. If you looked at it as a digital thing, as this thing has properties that tells it to bounce off and repel, then we might have a more accurate view. And, and the closer we get to understanding the underlying mass of how it actually works, let's say you're stuck in a video game, you don't know who built it, you don't know the, the programming language they use or anything, you have to try to figure out from the inside out, and it's going to be hard to do that, but eventually you will figure out the mass that they're using and, and, and how that ball is, is bouncing off you and why. And, and, but if you're in there, the illusion that it bounces off you is real. And you'd be like, hey, it's solid. And when you touch it, you know, when you bang on it, your hand bounces up and away from it, and it makes noise because it's programmed to do that. And that's how our world's programmed. This is what physicists tell us. So hopefully we're um, getting closer to understanding the digital universe, or in this case, digital physics. All right, thanks. Thanks for watching, and I'll come back with more. Get more into the nomic philosophy aspect of it, my aspect, what I think of how it works.